Okay, today we're going to be talking about cause effect essays. A cause effect essay is a kind of exposition essay. So you are also explaining something to your reader. Uh, and therefore, the structure of a cause effect essay is very similar. You start with an introduction. You have a main body that explains what your topic is, and then you have a conclusion. The job of your introduction and your conclusion is the same, so I won't repeat myself. For the middle part, as you might guess from the name of this essay, you should talk about the cause of something or the effect of something, or both. So you have three options for how to write a cause effect essay. You can choose one thing and talk about uh, the different possible reasons for that thing. You can choose one thing and talk about the many possible results of that thing, or you can do both. Choose one thing, talk about uh, all of the possible reasons for this thing, and then talk about all of the possible consequences of that thing. So how do you choose which format to use? Well, it depends on your topic, right? Depending on what topic you choose, maybe the reader will be more interested to learn about why this thing has happened. Or maybe uh, the reader cares more about what are the effects of that thing. Or if you choose a topic that is completely new and that few people have heard about, maybe the reader will want to know both. How did this happen? and what might it lead to in the future. So when you write a cause-effect essay, you can think about cause and effect logically, just you know, sit there and think about it, or you can also look for information. If you're writing about a historical event, then you can look for information about um, what people think caused this event and what kind of effect this event happened, uh, this effect had on later events in history. But you don't have to talk about history. You can talk about any kind of situation or phenomenon, xianxiang. Any uh, topic that you can come up with causes or you can come up with effects to talk about. So that's the theoretical introduction. Do you have questions? So remember, you don't have to do all the causes and all the effects. You can choose to do either causes or effects. Or if you really want to, you can do both. Now let's look at our textbook on page 65. Our textbook has two example essays, so let's look at these together. The Irish potato famine. A famine is when there's not enough food. Throughout much of its history, the United States has welcomed immigrants to its shores. People have come because of opportunity, political liberty, and religious freedom. Others have come because of oppression and poverty in their native countries. So already in the first three sentences, we have causes, right? The first sentence is the phenomenon. Uh, many people immigrate to the United States. The second sentence gives us some positive reasons because these people are looking for something. And the third sentence gives us negative reasons because these people are trying to get away from something. Let's continue line four. 
There is no greater example of the latter reason for immigration than the Irish who fled to this country during the Great Potato Famine of 1845 through 1851. They came because of their failed crops and their resulting starvation, the loss of their homes and possessions due, uh, to their indifferent landlords, and the ineffectiveness of the English and Irish governments to help them survive. So here we have our topic. Uh, immigrants from Ireland to the United States during the Great Potato Famine. Uh, after the topic, the essay gives us the main ideas that it will talk about. Uh, already it says that we will be talking about the latter reason. In other words, reasons that people want to leave their native countries. So what are the, we call in uh, geography, we call these push reasons, li, right? Uh, so what are some push reasons for Irish people to immigrate to the United States during this time? Failed crops and starvation. So their plants are not growing, they don't have enough food. Loss of their homes and possessions to their indifferent landlords. So their landlords, the people who own the land, don't care about them. They're indifferent, which means that they don't care. And so uh, even though there's not enough food, people are poor, landlords still took away people's homes and things. So that's the second reason. And the ineffectiveness of the government to help. And this is both the English and the Irish governments. At this time, Ireland was, uh, I think Ireland was still a colony of England. So when it says English and Irish governments, it's basically the same government. So these are the three main ideas of this essay, and we expect to read these ideas in this order. And so it looks like this essay is only going to talk about causes. The main effect is immigration from Ireland to the US. The conditions under which the majority of the 8 million Irish lived were shocking. There never was, the Duke of Wellington wrote, a country in which poverty existed to the extent it exists in Ireland. A census in 1841 reported nearly half of the rural population is living in the lowest state. People were crammed inside one room mud cabins without windows or furniture. Farmers slept with their pigs in filthy conditions. Homeless people put roofs over ditches or slept in tunnels they dug in the ground. So this whole paragraph is explaining how poor the Irish people were at that time. Uh, the main idea comes in the first sentence, right? People were extremely poor. Then you have a quote from an expert of the time. Uh, then you have data. A census is a survey of the people. Uh, and so the 1841 census talked about how poor everybody is. Then you have descriptions of how poor people lived. And then you have this. This is a person, Woodham Smith, and the number is a page number. We call this a citation. And it tells us that the above information comes from somewhere else. And it tells us how to find this information. Um, the PowerPoint does not have this part for some reason, but if you have a paper copy of your. Actually, I, let's see. Yeah, if you have a paper copy of your textbook and you go to page 67. 
uh, at the end, it has a small section called sources. Uh, and there it gives us the uh, name of the source of this information. So if you look at sources, the fourth one says Woodham Smith Cecil, The Great Hunger. So it looks like this is a book called The Great Hunger written by Woodham uh, by Cecil Woodham Smith. So that's where the author found this information. It's very important if you use information from somewhere else that you give a citation like this. And you tell me that this information comes from somewhere else. If you use information from somewhere else and you don't tell me, that's plagiarism. And if you hand in an essay with plagiarism, I will not mark it. If you submit an essay with plagiarism, I will give you a zero. So remember to include a citation for information that comes from other places. So remember the first cause we're talking about is failed crops and starvation. So the first part is Irish people were already very poor. All this misery could be traced to absentee English and wealthy Irish landlords. Absentee means that they're not here, like they own the land, but they don't live here. So why are Irish people poor? This paragraph tells us it's because of the landlords. In eight, an 1845 report stated that their property was merely a source from which to extract as much money as possible. Landlords leased their land to others who divided it so they could collect more rent. The Irish tenants Tenants are people who rent land. The Irish tenants paid for the right to farm it and to put a cabin up on the property quickly. No money was exchanged, however. The payments were measured by the number of days the tenants worked. So the essay tells us one main reason, or I guess it says the reason uh, so many Irish people were poor is because of their landlords. And here it explains how this system works or how it used to work. Today, when we talk about landlords, we expect, oh, if I live here, I have to pay you money every month. But at that time, instead of money, the uh, farmers worked for the landlord for a few days every month. This arrangement depended entirely and exclusively on the potato. It grew easily in the bad soil and was easy to cook. The potato was also perfect for feeding pigs, cattle, and chickens. The crop, however, would rot soon after harvesting and could not be stored between growing seasons. By 1840, one third of the Irish population depended entirely on the potato for food. It was a dependency that teetered on the brink of starvation and created a time bomb that needed only the slightest spark to explode. A dependency that teetered on the brink of starvation means like one thing goes wrong and people will go hungry. It's almost there. So uh, in the previous paragraph, it told us that tenants would work for their landlords. In this paragraph, it tells us that this work was basically that they would grow potatoes. Uh, and among all of the benefits of potatoes, right, it grows easily, easy to cook, can feed your animals. There is one disadvantage. You could not store potatoes between seasons. They go bad very quickly. 
Uh, and this could be a problem, right? If up to, uh, where is it? One third of Irish people depended on growing potatoes and potatoes cannot last for very long, then it seems like one year where the potatoes can't grow would cause a lot of problems. Let's see if this is the case. So you'll notice that we're talking about a potato famine, and these therefore would all be reasons why a potato famine would be a terrible situation. That spark exploded in 1845 when the potato crop was attacked by a fungus. Uh, a fungus is like uh, a mushroom, shringle. The leaseholders dug the potatoes up only to find that they had turned into a dark, gooey mess. Six months later, the famine began. It continued and grew worse virtually every year until 1850. So the famine began in 1845 and it went all the way to 1850. Remember, potatoes go bad quickly. So basically, starting from 1846, people did not have a lot of food. At first, the British government tried to help by importing Indian corn from the United States. Uh, here, Indian does not mean from India. It means Native American. However, the corn made many people ill and most tenants had to sell or pawn all their possessions to pay for it. Uh, to pawn something means to sell it temporarily, and if you have money, you can buy it back. So, on the one hand, the people couldn't digest the corn, and on the other hand, it cost people money to buy this corn that they could not eat. So, not a very good plan. Then the government initiated a second plan, hiring the farm laborers to build roads and canals. Canals are waterways. By December of 1846, half a million men were breaking rocks up into pieces and shoveling dirt. Um, a shovel is a tool you use to move dirt from here to there. Tanzi. At this point, however, some workers died of starvation before receiving their wages. So by that point, the Irish people were so hungry that they couldn't even make it to payday. They would work and work and before they could get paid, they would die. The famine worsened in 1846 when disease struck the potato crop again. A stranger, wrote a sub-inspector of police from County Cork, would wonder how these wretched beings find food. They sleep in their rags and have pawned their bedding. Unfortunately, much of the food they found was the seed potatoes for next year's crop. As a result, when the 1847 harvest came in free of disease, it was too small to feed everyone. In 1848, the situation worsened as the blight came back, destroying the entire crop. So 1845, you have a fungus. 1846, you have a disease. Uh, and so people needed to eat something, so they ate the seeds for next year's potatoes. So 1847, not enough potatoes. And then 1848, another disease. Uh, that's what the word blight means. A blight is a disease for uh, farm plants, for, for uh, plants that you grow for food. By this time, 
even the landlords became desperate. They threw out half a million tenants who could not pay their rent through labor and then burned their homes. Why would they burn the homes? To prevent these people from secretly moving back in without paying rent. Consequently, many went to live in poor houses. In 1847, however, all public work projects ended and public poor houses were closed. Now with the tenants homeless and living in filth, typhoid fever, cholera, and dysentery broke out. These are all diseases. Claiming more lives than starvation itself. An official estimate claimed that 750,000 people died from the famine and related causes, but the true number may have been twice as many. So again, you have a cause, landlords kicking people out, burning their homes, and then uh, all public work projects ended. And so you have effects. People are homeless, they get diseases, and they uh, die of those diseases. As a result, a million Irish poor fled the country most of them heading by boat across the Atlantic. The conditions on these coffin ships were horrifying, and many people died during the journey. Of those who survived, the great majority went to Quebec and Montreal, Canada. But after arriving, over half walked across the border to the United States. They wanted no part of living in Canada, a British colony. I want you to pay attention to this coffin ships. This is put in quotation marks. Earlier, we also saw some quotations. Uh, but after these quotations, you have a source. So this tells us that these words were copied from this source. Or here, this these words were taken from this source and were said by this person. But here, there is no source, or the source is far below, and we don't see who said these words. This quotation, or sorry, these quotation marks are therefore not a quotation. They're telling us that these words are used in a special way. So without quotation marks, when we see coffin ships, a coffin is where you would put a dead body, guan cai. Without these quotation marks, if you see the words coffin ships, you might think, oh, these ships are carrying coffins to sell. Um, but by putting the quotation marks around these two words, we know that this is a special term. And so we expect some kind of explanation. Indeed, in the second half of the sentence, it says that the conditions were horrifying and many people died. And so we understand that these are coffin ships, not because they're selling empty coffins, but because so many people died on these ships. So at, like as a result, so this tells us this entire paragraph is the effect of all of the causes that we have been reading above. The Irish viewed the rapidly growing United States as a land of opportunity. These poor immigrants showed up in rags without money, education or skill, but they had a small glimmer of hope. Over the last nearly two centuries, that hope has been fully realized. The Irish population of the United States has more than doubled that of all of Ireland. And an Irish American was even elected to the most powerful position in the United States. 
John Fitzgerald Kennedy became the first Irish American president in 1961. Um, so the main effect of uh, this essay was already presented in paragraph nine. Paragraph 10 is therefore the conclusion. You don't have to worry too much about cause and effect. This paragraph, remember, is supposed to show the reader the future, to push the reader into the future. This essay is about something that happened in the middle of the 19th century. So by mentioning something that happened in 1961, that counts as the future for this essay. Um, so if we go back to the first paragraph, it says that we will be reading about failed crops and starvation, loss of homes and possessions to indifferent landlords, and the ineffectiveness of the government. Did we read all of this? Yes, we did. All of these are part of this essay. Um, but before we get to the first reason, we have to understand why failed crops and would lead to starvation. In the usual situation, if one year you don't grow enough food, there should be some food left over from last year. It shouldn't uh, immediately cause a famine. And so the essay first has to explain why this situation is not a normal situation. So the second paragraph first tells us about the extreme poverty in Ireland. Uh, then it talked about the economic system between farmers and their landlords in paragraph three. And this leads to paragraph four, an explanation of how important the potato was at that time. So all of this, paragraphs two, three, and four, all of this is necessary information to understand the causes and the uh, effect. So paragraph five begins describing the causes. Uh, failed crops, right? The potatoes turned into a dark gooey mess. Paragraph six, the government tries to help, but their plan does not work. So ineffective government. Paragraph seven, uh, the crops continue to fail. 1846, failed. 1847, not enough. 1848, keeps failing. Paragraph eight is the last thing, talking about uh, indifferent landlords. Landlords who don't care about the farmers. And so uh, by this point in the essay, we have covered all of the all three important points um, that the first paragraph told us we would talk about. So paragraph nine is the effect. A million people moved to North America. And then paragraph 10 is the conclusion. So this is an example of an essay that chooses one topic and explains all of the different causes that would lead to this situation. Questions? OK, let's look at the second essay. This is on page 68. The explosive growth of the cities. By the end of the 19th century, immigrants from southern and eastern Europe crowded into cities that were already heavily populated by native born Americans. So this is another essay about history, end of the 19th century. And it already it gives us the cause. We know that this essay will be about growing cities. And the first sentence gives us the cause. People came from southern and eastern Europe. Let's continue. As a result, 
the cities suffered greatly from the effects of rapid growth. Uh, so cities were growing too fast and they caused some problems. Sanitation, which means public health. Fire protection and the paving of streets were inadequate. So like the streets were not entirely covered. Housing was insufficient and overcrowded. Families fell apart and crime grew out of control. Because of the extent of these problems, however, people eventually took steps to improve living conditions. So uh, again, the first paragraph tells us what we are going to read about. Sanitation, fire protection, paving of streets were bad, housing was bad, and families fell apart, so crime increased. These are the three main ideas of this essay. So it looks like this will be an essay about one situation, more and more people coming to live in cities with many different effects. One cause, many effects. Sewer and water facilities could not keep pace with the rapidly increasing needs. A sewer is the kind of pipe where you would flush out dirty water. Uh, um, so this is the first thing, right? Sanitation, public health. By the 1890s, the tremendous growth of Chicago had put such a strain on the sanitation system that the Chicago River had become virtually an open sewer. The city's drinking water contained such a high concentration of germ killing chemicals that it was almost undrinkable. In the 1880s, all the sewers of Baltimore emptied into the Back River Basin. According to the journalist H.L. Mencken, every summer smelled like a billion polecats. A uh, polecat is a wild stray cat on the street. Wait, I don't think that's right. Sorry, a polecat is a skunk. Uh, it's an old word. Today we just say skunk. So this is the sanitation part. Fire protection became less and less adequate. Garbage piled up on the streets faster than workers could carry it away. The streets themselves crumbled beneath the pounding of heavy traffic. Urban growth proceeded with such speed that the cities laid out new streets much more rapidly than they could be paved. Chicago had more than 1,400 miles of dirt streets in 1890. So like this paragraph is the first point, right? Sanitation, fire protection, streets. The population explosion also placed a great strain on the housing supply. So this is the second point. People poured into the great cities faster than houses and apartments could be built for them. As a result, the densely packed areas of the 1840s became unbearable. Greedy builders used every foot of space, squeezing out light and air in order to jam in a few additional family units. Substandard living quarters aggravated other evils, such as the breakdown of family life, along with mental distress, crime, and juvenile delinquency. Juvenile delinquency means uh, kids who do crimes. Uh, so uh, this is here it's saying that uh, too many people, so the housing was too crowded, and that crowded housing also caused many problems. Breakdown of family life. Why would crowded housing cause the breakdown of family life? 
well, if your home is too small, you can't spend all day with your family. You have to spend most of your day outdoors. And so uh, your relationship with your family might be less strong. You might grow distant from your family members. Um, overcrowding leads to mental distress. We can understand this. Overcrowding leads to crime. Too many people, not enough resources. OK. And juvenile delinquency, which is also just crime. The bloody, OK, so like in a good essay, you would explain all of these points, but this is a very short example essay. The bloody New York riots of 1863, for example, were caused in part by the bitterness and frustration of thousands jammed together. So it's so crowded that people could not take it and they took to the streets to riot. Baodong. A citizens committee expressed amazement after visiting the slums that so much misery, disease and wretchedness can be huddled together and hidden. Uh, notice that the people who go to look at the situation are not the government. It's a citizens committee, which means people come together to organize a way to find out what's really going on, not the government. So this is the second thing, right? Uh, housing leads to crime and other things. Sorry, that was the third point, right? The second point is housing. The third point is crime and, and like other social problems. Eventually, however, practical forces operated to bring about improvements. Once the relationship between polluted water and disease was fully understood, everyone saw the need for clean water and decent sewage systems. City dwellers of all classes resented the dirt, noise, and ugliness. In many communities, public spirited groups form societies to plant trees, clean up littered areas, and develop recreational facilities. When one city took on improvements, others tended to follow suit, prompted by local pride and competition between cities. So our three main effects already have been presented, right? Sanitation, fire, streets. Paragraph three is housing. Paragraph four is social problems. And so the next paragraph is about the next effect. So remember, cause effect is not just cause and effect, right? You can keep going. One effect can be the next thing's cause. So the first cause is uh, population growth. And then you have the three big issues of this uh, essay. And these issues caused people to try to improve the situation. So that's paragraph five. And you'll notice that the order of these things is the same throughout the entire essay. So in paragraph one, uh, first it's sanitation, fire protection, pave, uh, streets, then it's housing, then it's social issues in that order. And so sanitation, fire protection, streets, housing, social problems. In paragraph five also, sanitation, polluted water and disease, that's the first thing. Then dirt, noise and ugliness has to do with too many people living in the same place. So this is housing. And then you have people uh, planting trees, cleaning up trash and developing recreational facilities. This is actually connected with crime. One reason that people uh, did not follow the law all the time is because there was just nothing to do. They were very bored. Uh, there was no way to uh, use their time in a more productive way. So by developing recreational facilities, places where they can go and play sports, 
places they can go to read or study uh, or talk. This helps to prevent crime. So here also it's the same order, sanitation, housing, social issues. Uh, and these effects also started to spread to other cities due to local pride, pride in your own city and competition between cities. Gradually, the basic facilities of urban living were improved. Streets were paved first with stones and wood blocks and then with smoother, quieter asphalt. Asphalt is black top, leaching. Gas light, then electric arc lights, and finally Thomas Edison's incandescent lamps brightened the cities after dark. Uh, so like in the cities, the first kind of light was by gas, uh, and then the next are electric arc lights, but electric arc lights are very uh, wasteful. They create more heat than light. Um, I'm not quite sure what, how to describe arc lights in Chinese, but the idea is uh, you would have two poles and the air in the middle would be polarized and the air itself would have energy and give off heat and light. Um, so it's heated air. And then you have Edison's light bulb. Now, of course, a light bulb is not heated air, it's heated metal in between. This illumination of the cities made law enforcement easier. So like if cops can see at night, they can prevent crime easier. It also stimulated nightlife and permitted factories and shops to operate after sunset. And so like at this point, we're already leaving behind uh, what we were talking about, right? So uh, streets, first point, or, and then um, lighting has to do with crime. I guess nightlife um, gives people a place to go, I guess, uh, when they're escaping their crowded homes. Life in the cities was far from ideal, but streetcars would take people quickly and inexpensively to work and back. And high rise buildings would soon fill the horizons. So this is how the housing situation improved. High rise buildings allowed for more people to live on the same space of land. And streetcars let people live farther away from the city center. So now you have more space to build houses. Uh, by the way, a streetcar is not a car, right? It's a it's like a train. The modern American city was forming throughout the East and Midwest. Um, by this sentence, you can already tell that this is the conclusion because it's no longer just past tense. It said would take. Would take is it's looking at the future from the past. Like if it said will take, you're looking at the future from the present, but it said would take, so you're looking at the future from the past. But either way, you're looking at the future. So this is coming to the end of the essay. Um, so this essay is an example of one cause leading to many effects. The cause is in the first sentence. People started moving to cities in the US and the population exploded, leading to these problems. And then you have one paragraph per problem. These problems led to efforts to improve the situation 
And by improving the situation, we, uh, we gradually come to get the kinds of cities that we see today. Right, bringing it all the way from the 19th century to today. And so that's the conclusion of the essay. Questions? OK, let's do some. Grammar practice. Don't know you're in Uh If you have a paper textbook, please turn to page 78. Right. Um, in this practice, we're going to practice parallelism. Pai bi. This is grammar. Parallelism means you have more than one thing using the same grammar. So I'll give you an, uh, one example. Uh, controversy over immigrants and language history. So uh, in, in this um, practice, you want to find faulty parallelism. So here, millions of Germans moved to the United States in the 1800s and not bringing, right? It's moved and brought. The grammar... Ooh. The grammar has to be the same. OK. So uh, let's see, how many are there? There are four more. Um, catching errors is harder than uh, the usual kind of practice. So I'll give you Um, I'll give you until the end of break. There should be four more places that are uh, that have to be corrected.
OK, let's compare answers. Um, the textbook is very kind. It gives you some hints. Right, the italicized verbs or words, zi, are hints of possible mistakes. So the first one, moved to the United States and brought their language. Second one, taught in German, published German speaking newspapers, and spoke German. All three are past tense. The next one spoke German at home, in stores, and also spoke it in taverns. Don't need these words, right? At home, in stores, and in taverns. The next one speaking English at home, but also not would speak, speaking German when they visited their parents. Last one. The Japanese, the Italians, Eastern Europeans, and all of these are nouns, right? Nouns, nouns, nouns. So you don't need to say there are. And many more. Question. So remember, parallelism is about the grammar. The things you're listing, the things you're comparing should have the same grammar. OK, let's go on and do practice nine. This is also very important. How do you do punctuation for quotation marks? Uh, there are two main rules to remember. If the thing that is being quoted is a full sentence, then it should begin with a capital letter. This is a full and complete sentence. So the first word should be in capital letters. If it's not a full and complete sentence, then you can begin with a lowercase letter. The second thing to pay attention to is if the end of the quotation is a period, Judian, or a comma, Doha, put it inside the quotation mark. But if it's anything else, you have to think. If it's a question mark, Wen Hao, if it's an exclamation point, Jing Tan Hao. If it's a colon, ma hao, semicolon, fen hao, you have to think. Does this belong with the quotation? Or is it part of the bigger sentence? So like maybe you're asking a sentence and in uh, you're asking a question, and in your question there is a quotation. Therefore, the quotation mark would not go inside the quotation. Because you are asking the sentence. The quotation itself is not a sentence. Does that make sense? So only for periods and commas, they always go inside the quotation mark. Um, so for number two to six, you first have to uh, determine where does the quotation begin and where does the quotation end? And then you have to, to see how do you use the punctuation. You'll notice that it does not give you a period. So you have to decide what is the ending punctuation. So, right, so two questions, or three questions. Where does the quotation begin and end? 
should the first word of the quotation have a capital letter? And where do you put where do you put the ending punctuation mark? Five questions, I'll give you another 10 minutes. Sorry, I forgot to say one thing. Um, before the quotation begins, there should be a comma. In one case, Chen, you have find a Julian. Actually, do you guys want to do these together? Let's do these together. Uh, this will be a good learning opportunity for you to learn about quotation marks. Question two, during the Civil War, uh, President Abraham Lincoln cautioned, it is best not to swap horses while crossing the river. Uh, so where does the quotation begin? During the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln cautioned it is best not to swap horses while crossing the river. So it looks like it begins here. Cautioned is the word that tells us he is saying something. So before the quotation begins, you add a comma, right? Cautioned, comma, quotation mark. And then this is a complete sentence, so it needs to be a capital I. And then at the end, this is not a question, so you period and then quotation mark. Is that too fast? Okay. So again, first find where the quotation begins, add a comma, quotation mark, capital letter if it's a complete sentence. And at the end of the quotation, see what kind of mark you need, and then add a quotation mark after that. Next one, a house divided against itself cannot stand, Lincoln also said. Where does the quotation begin? At the very beginning, a house divided its against itself cannot stand. Lincoln also said. So this is the same thing, right? Somebody said blah, but the order is switched around right here it said lincoln cautioned something but here something lincoln said same rules uh beginning of the quotation so you have a quotation mark here at the end of the quotation this is not a question so period but this is not the end of the bigger sentence if a quotation ends in the middle of the bigger sentence, change the period into a comma. Cannot stand comma, quotation mark. Lincoln also said period. Questions? Okay, next one. The ballot, Lincoln added, is much stronger than the bullet. So where does the quotation begin? The beginning of the sentence. 
right? The only two words that are not part of the quotation are Lincoln added. So quotation mark. Separating the quotation from the non quotation, a comma. Quotation mark. Comma quotation mark. Should this word be in capital letters? No, because it's not the beginning of a sentence, right? This quoted sentence began here. So quotation mark, blah, 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 period, quotation mark. Next one, why should there not be a persistent confidence in the ultimate judgment of the people, said Lincoln? in his first inaugural address, is there any better or equal hope in this world? Ah, so why? We started, we're starting to have questions. Uh, said Lincoln in his first inaugural address is not part of the quotation. Everything else is a quotation. So quotation mark, blah, 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 end of this sentence. Is this a complete sentence? Why should there not be something? Confidence in something. It looks like it's a complete sentence. So question mark. It's a question. Question mark. Quotation mark. This next part is a complete sentence. Is there any better or equal hope in this world is a complete sentence. So period instead of comma. Quotation, uh, quotation mark, beginning of new sentence, capital letter, question mark, and quotation mark. Questions? This one is a bit more complicated because it's actually two sentences. Uh, Lincoln said two sentences, and the author wants to put uh, said Lincoln in between the two sentences. And this is how you do that. Um, no matter like the relationship between the sentence and the quotation, if you reach the end of a sentence, you have to use a period. This is the end of the sentence. Some people make this mistake. They think because it's the same quotation, they can keep going with a comma. But you can't because the sentence is finished. You have to start a new sentence even though it's the same quotation. Last one. Mark Twain, the famous American author, once wrote, aha, wrote, which means this is going to be a quotation. Once wrote, comma, quotation mark, always do write, this will gratify some people and astonish the rest. Is this a complete sentence? No. It's two complete sentences. Always do right, which means always do the right thing. This is a complete sentence. So capital A, complete sentence, so period. Uh, capital T, this will gratify some people and astonish the rest. End of sentence, period, quotation mark. <laughs> there should be a period here. OK, do you have questions about uh, quotation marks? If you have questions in the future, you can come back to this page. These are all of the situations that you might need to know about quotation marks. OK. Um, so for the rest of today, uh, I will let you have time to think about what you want to write for your cause effect essay. If you have not yet handed in your exposition essay, please hand in a paper copy to my department office mailbox. And this is where my mailbox is.
Right. So please hand in your paper copy uh, to my mailbox before fifth period next Thursday. Uh, next Monday, we have a holiday. So please hand in before fifth period next Thursday. Um, but don't wait for the deadline. Hand in as soon as you can. If you miss that deadline, things become a little more complicated. Please then, uh, you can also have the option of uploading your essay to Moodle. Again, as soon as possible. If you upload your essay, I will mark it on the computer and then I will upload it to um, this place. Uh, you guys are the early afternoon class. I will upload your marked essay here. Uh, please, there, uh, after I have uploaded it, it depends how many people will need this. If it's like one or two people, I will tell you. But um, before class, please come here and download your marked essay. Don't. Uh, you have to download it. And the reason is because like if you click your essay here, it will open it in your web browser, but you need to download it. And the reason is because I will be marking your essay using track changes. So you don't show thing. And if you don't know how to use track changes, I also have a video for you. Right, so you have to download it, right? Download. And when you download it and you open the file, it will first look like this, like a normal file. Go up here and select uh, show all markups. And you will suddenly see all the things that I have corrected. But you have to download it or you can't see those marks. Make sense? OK, so uh, if you didn't hand in your essay today, don't worry. You have until <laughs> next Thursday. <laughs> the next time you will only have up until the uh, subsequent Thursday. Uh, OK, questions? Next week, is a holiday. The week after that, the first conference. So what this means is um, I will hand back your essays. And then I will call your names one by one and you will come to the front and we will talk about your essay. And that's what we'll be doing the next class. Um, and if you somehow miss the deadline of October 13 and you hand in a uh, file online, then I will like open your essay on my computer and we will talk about your essay. If you are not able to come to class, Please tell me as soon as you can. I will scan your essay. I will upload it to the uh, folder on Moodle and uh, I will use Teams to open your essay and we will talk about your essay uh, online. Um, yes. But that also means that, uh, let's see, that also, Maybe I can bring like headphones or something. That's what I'm saying. If you want to talk about it, you can talk about it. We'll take care of that next time. Do you have questions about uh, next class? Do you have questions about next class? Do you have questions about next class? Okay, for the rest of today, please start thinking about what you want to write about for your cause effect essay. You can talk with your classmates, you can start planning your essay. And if you have questions, you can come and ask me.